Got a very special guest for you because this guy has he knows what he's talking about. He's figured it out, and he's written a book for us. The end is near, and it's going to be awesome. <laughs> you know what? We always talk about Armageddon, but no, no, no one ever says, Kevin D. Williamson, that is going to be awesome. Why, why is it going to be so awesome? Well, you know, I have a, a great deal of faith in capitalism and in the American people, and I have a great deal of suspicion about politics. And I think that once the money finally runs out, once the shell game is over and we're able to put resources back into things that are productive, into the innovative ends of the economy, we'll end up in a situation in which we're actually much, much better off. And a lot of the things that we're trying to solve with the welfare state, things like health care, retirements, education, we'll actually be able to do those in a, in a real and effective and fruitful way. So and, and essentially what you're saying then is that, you know, uh, Margaret Thatcher said, you know, the problem with socialism is once, you know, eventually you run out of other people's money. Yeah. But we, know, we never had anyone that picked up from there. So what happens after we run out of other people's <laughs> money? Essentially what you're saying is a natural occurrence. This is, this is sort of a natural occurrence. Yeah. I mean, if there's no money, we've lost our credit, we've, we've put ourselves in this enormous debt, we have no other choice but to go back to, to go and not collect $200. Yeah, in fact, we're already far past the point of being out of other people's money. If you look at our total unfunded liabilities and debt, it's currently almost twice the world's money supply. So we're, we're well past the point of being past <laughs> other people's money. Maybe in, Mars. I mean, yeah, in fact, there's life you, up there. If you exclude real estate, our unfunded liabilities are equal to about the value of all the assets in the world. So there's just no way it gets paid. Uh, it's just a mathematical certainty that's not going to get paid so out. So then we play the shell game, right? I mean, we pay the interest on it. Sure. You know, we maybe we manipulate the currency every now and then. I mean, it, but eventually even that shell game runs out. Yeah, you know, I mean, I've been broke before. We've all been broke. You know, you've been out of a job. You're in that position where you're calling the car company and telling them the check's in the mail. And that's pretty much national policy right now. It's just telling the Chinese the check's in the mail or it's going to be there. But eventually it's not. Eventually you have to make good. So, you, but you look at things like, say, Social Security. You know, it's a terrible system. Actually, it's a it's a bad return for a lot of people. Um, in retirement, it doesn't give you anything like a decent income. Right. But if you took that twelve percent that people and their employers are paying in, you had people invest that even in something very conservative over the course of their entire working careers, then they can retire with an income that's equivalent to what they were making when right. they were working. Right. Um, it works, and they can do that after. It doesn't take 50 years either. It takes, right. you know, more like 40. You know, Kevin, i got to tell you, you're preaching to the choir on yeah. that one. One thing I'd love to do, maybe we can do it together, is uh, and I've been thinking about maybe getting some college kids to look and see if we had put a certain amount of money, Social Security money, into uh, the stock market for the last 20 or 30 years. And, and people say, well, what about the crash? Well, first of all, you know, the markets go up and down, but we're, mm -hmm. we're just coming off at all-time high. Secondly, it would mitigate crashes. Because this is money that's not going to sell in a panic. Right. So you mitigate the downside. So instead of going to 6000 on the Dow, we go to 9000 Instead of being at 15000 now, we're at 18000 I mean, we're talking about taking American money and investing in great American companies. Yeah, I mean, and you're in the business. You know, there's the difference between guys who trade every day at a desk and people who are on a 40-year plan, people who are on a 50-year plan. But the part that's often overlooked about that isn't just the returns to the investor. It's that money actually gets used for something productive while it's invested. So in a sense, while you're working and saving over the course of your career, you're also funding the R&D for the research, for the medical products, for the other things that you're going to be using in your right. retirement. You're actually building the economy and building the benefits that you yourself are going to collect. It takes capital to do that. And without that capital, without that investment, there's just simply no way to provide for people. And, and I guess, though, here's the problem. Uh, you know, the, people are just uh, a thousand percent against that idea. Yeah. Uh, and, and to your point, you know, I've studied the, the whole welfare system and, you know, I, you know how we adopted it from, from Germany. But, you mm -hmm. know, what happened in Germany, you know, a lot of people don't realize that they just went through with the, the welfare system in a way to stop the advance of socialism. Yeah. You know, they, you know, they figured, you know what, if we're living to, to 50 and we'll make the retirement age 65, it's, it's, a, it's a moot point. Yeah, Bismarck was worried about a communist revolution or, you know, a socialist revolution. And he figured, well, let's take half their platform and just enact it, and that'll cut half their uh, legs out from under them. But even in the end, it's not being sustainable. You know, people always talk about Sweden. Sweden's the great example right. of the Nordic welfare state. Well, if you've been following Swedish politics for the last 10 or 15 years, they've been doing reforms that American conservatives haven't dreamed of. You know, they've been privatizing aspects of their health care system. They've been reforming their tax code. Uh, you know, the same thing in places like, well, Norway is kind of a special case because they've got oil money. Yeah, they've got uh, but, so much oil and so few people. They've got the largest sovereign wealth fund in the world, yeah. so they're but sitting you, pretty on cash. You know, you look at Canada. We probably talk about Canada as a big budget place. You know, they've got a balanced budget. They did it mostly by cutting spending. 
Uh, they've been and, pretty, and, and we pretty should note good. they've been cutting yeah. taxes for the last few years. Yeah, Canada. they have. Yeah. Uh, once they, you know, once they got things under control, they were able to reform their tax code a little bit and uh, and do some intelligent things. So, you know, a lot of these countries that Americans look at as examples of how the welfare state works are about ten years ahead of where Americans typically are paying attention to the news, and they've been reforming this stuff and changing things uh, considerably. You know, I just came back from Switzerland, and you know, Switzerland's another place people think of as kind of a great European welfare state. Of course, it's in many ways got a more free market economy than the United States does. It's got no capital gains tax. Uh, do you wonder why people invest there? Because <laughs> the capital gains tax is 0.0%, right. which right. is not a bad deal. Yeah. There's a reason Tina Turner So in other words, there. you get to keep the money that you invest, huh? That's yeah. a novel idea. It's you not, take the risk and idea. you get to keep the reward. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, and, and particularly Sweden's an interesting example of that because they did all the things that American liberals want to do, and they screwed their country up. And they really had to start fixing it about 15 years ago in order to keep their economy functioning. And it's still most people don't appreciate how poor a country Sweden is. Really? Uh, yeah. If it were if it were the 51st state in the United States, it would be the poorest state in the United States. Really? It's uh, per capita Whoa. GDP is about 22 percent below. We've got this lofty idea that yeah. Sweden somehow, you know, to your point, they you know that they've completely figured it out. And yeah, on, they, a, on a per capita basis, it's poorer than Mississippi. Wow, I, I, you know, I did not know that. I'm glad you brought that up. Let's talk about though the obvious basket <laughs> cases in Europe that, um, <laughs> you know, the the Greeces and the yeah. Portugals of, the, of of the world. It took them a long time to to break. I mean, listen, um, and I and I tell and I always tell conservatives, particularly politicians, that you guys really put yourself in a corner by suggesting that Obama's policies would, you know, crack America's back overnight because it just doesn't happen that quick. Yeah. We just got too much. Our economy is too dynamic for it to happen overnight, and Greece didn't become Greece overnight. Not the Greece that we know is a cautionary tale. Right. Yeah, if you're a country like us, it's responsible for between 20 and 25 percent of the world's GDP. You can handle a lot of buffoonery. You know, it's, <laughs> it, takes, it takes a while to bankrupt a country like right, this. Right. You know, we're 300, of the richest million, 300 million of the richest people in the world. It's going to take a while to screw up the United States irrevocably. It doesn't mean it can't be done. Right. And it doesn't mean we're not on that path. Yeah. But, you know, since the, the European crisis, I spent some time in Spain. And, uh, you know, it's a lovely, wonderful, sunny country where you can sit on the sidewalks and drink coffee and all that stuff and wonderful beaches and all that. But it's a nightmare. Uh, it's like, you know, the parts of China you read about where they're just blocks and blocks and whole little subdevelopments of empty apartment buildings and, uh, you know, just empty residential developments, empty uh, real estate. The uh, unemployment rate there is just through the roof. It's insane. Now, it's great because when you go there, you're an American, you get to feel rich. Right. You go to Switzerland, you feel poor. Right. And uh, But for the people who have to live there, you know, who aren't British people with vacation homes right. there or retirement homes there, but actual Spanish people living in Spain, uh, where you've got unemployment rate for youth that are, was it 25% now, 27%, something like that? I think that's the overall, right? Uh, or isn't the youth even higher than yeah, that? Yeah, it might be. Yeah, I mean, right. and particularly in, in, in outside of the major urban and, areas. And, and, yeah. I, and I read somewhere in Spain where um, one-fifth of the people 30 and under never had a job. Yeah, that's the really terrifying part. And, uh, you know, we get that in some enclaves in the United States. I did a piece about unemployment in New York a couple years ago where I went up and spent some time in the Bronx where I was living at the time. They were you know, working on this redevelopment project up there that went off the rails. And uh, there's this shocking number of uh, African-American men in the Bronx who are in their 30s or 40s who've never had a regular job yeah. in their entire lives. Yeah. It's really hard to start a career at 40. You know, I'm 40. I don't know if I had to start all over. I don't know what I would do. <laughs> well, you know, it's so funny. I was on the uh, board of directors for uh, a charter school in the Bronx, in yeah. the South Bronx. And I, I would tell people that, that in this part, this South Bronx, the congressional district, is the poorest in the country. Jose people, Serrano's district. Yeah, they, I live people, there. People don't believe me. Yeah. And, and now one, one, 19 percent are African, not African-American. Right. They just came over on the boat yesterday, you know. Yeah. And so, um, you know, to, 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 you know, to back up what you're, what you're saying, but... Walk me through this scenario yeah. that we're going to sort of fall apart here and there's not going to be riots in the street. I've got this, and I mm -hmm. talked about this earlier in the show. In Hawaii, you add up the benefits you get, the welfare benefits. You got a $49,000 a year package there. I'm sitting yeah. out, I'm chilling out, and I'm getting 49 Gs a year, and all of a sudden you turn off the spigot. I'm looking for, you know, I'm going in the street with a, yeah. a pitchfork and a torch and maybe something even more deadly. Yeah, the thing about that is, now I, I don't actually think that's what's going to happen, but for the people who are inclined to uh, go that way, it's not going to matter. 
I mean, the money's not there. The money's not there. You can scream about it. You can pout about it. You can set buildings on fire. You can do whatever you want. But what, how does it play out? Then I'm trying to envision it. Is it like yeah. soil and green and we start eating people? Yeah, well, that's the, <laughs> the real challenge from here on out is determining how it's going to play out. I mean, there are basically two ways. You can have a sort of slow crisis where things get reformed piece by piece. Uh, you start reforming the obvious things like Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, the welfare system. You know, you reform them slowly right now, gently. Or at some point, you have to do it all at once. And if you get into that situation where it's, oh, there was a Social Security check last month, and there's not going to be one this month, that's when you get real social disorder, which right. is you know, part of the point of this book is that even if they're not the perfect basket of reforms, because there are going to be Democrats in the world, there are going to be Democrats in Congress, there's going to be Barack Obama in the White House, and if it's not him, it's going to be some other imperfect person. Even if it's not the perfect package of reforms, you have to start doing some of those things right now. Now, on that note, though, do you see the political will for that? I mean, we're, we're nothing happens, nothing gets done at all. I right. mean, and I just, I think it's so murky. I think the finger pointing, the name calling. Yeah. I, I don't even get how we can even consider these, our, our elected leaders. I, you know, for me personally, there are only a handful of people in D.C. that I have a lot of respect for. Yeah, I mean, and, and not a very big hand. Right. You know, it's a small <laughs> handful. Uh, you know, people talk about term limits. My, uh, my, my policy actually would be decimation. Just every year draw lots and take a tenth of them out on the mall and shoot them. But uh, since that's not likely to happen any time in the future. No. Uh, political will is not going to get itself sorted out. What has to happen is the credit markets eventually override political will. When uh, interest rates on federal borrowing goes from, you know, essentially nothing where it is now up to its historical average of between 7.5% and 8.5%, suddenly you've got a Pentagon-sized hole in the budget. Uh, you know, suddenly your debt service goes to a trillion dollars a year or more. Right. You know, even in my lifetime, my short little lifetime, we've had interest rates on federal debt approaching 20 percent uh, in the 80s. If they should get even, you know, close to that, 12 percent, 13 percent, you're talking about a situation in which practically all revenue is going to go just to be servicing debt costs. At that point, it becomes a lot easier to make those decisions about what do we do about welfare, what do we do about Social Security, simply because you don't have any more choices. Now, um, could we, would it be fair to say that maybe uh, the sort of um, proxy for that, not proxy, but maybe the litmus test for it would be Detroit. Will that be, will that be our little you know, uh, experiment to, to see how this plays out on a larger scale, or, or will there be some sort of intervention there that, that, that avoids the worst-case scenario? Well, Detroit's pretty bad. You know, I think the Democrats ought to have their convention every four years in Detroit, and Republicans ought to have theirs in Houston. And just this is what our policies look like right. at the end of the day. This, right. is, this is where they go. Now, Detroit actually is not going to be the most interesting case. The most interesting thing would be when it's a state, because we do have a body of law for dealing with city bankruptcies. There is a way for dealing with city bankruptcies. But we also have some bankrupt states. California is one of them. Well, how come they Illinois keep saying is that California is the miracle and Jerry Brown has brought in a <laughs> surplus? What kind of funky math are they using? Because yeah. I'm like, there's no way in the world you guys can be and 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 uh, you know taking a bass but swimming in cash. Yeah. There's no way. Well, as you know, as a guy who looks at at, at company balance sheets a lot, accounting's really easy when you don't have to account for your actual liabilities. <laughs> and the thing about you know the way government accounting works is you can take your real liabilities and just pretend like they're not there. California hasn't solved its pension situation. You know, I was out there a couple years ago. I did a tour of all the bankrupt cities in California. I was in San Bernardino when they declared bankruptcy. It was a lot of fun. And I was talking to the mayor of uh, San Jose, who at the time, he was a liberal Democrat guy. He's not me. You know, he's not some libertarian kook. And, uh, and he was saying, look, the union's going to bankrupt the state. That's all there is. We have to do something about the pension, the pensions. We just simply have to. I'm going to say this, and when I say it, I'm going to get chased out of office for, which I think I actually did. I think that guy's now no longer in office. But, um, you know, even liberal Democrats get it up there. They can look at the flow statements and the balance sheets and say, you just can't do this. At some point, you have to say no. We're speaking with Kevin D. Williamson, the book, The End is Near, and It's Going to Be Awesome. Oh, and there's more. Let me read the rest of it. How going broke will leave America richer, happier, and more secure. That's but the transition to that state of bliss is going to be tough, and that's and that's the big yeah. big question mark, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, there's uh, and a lot of what this book is about is you know how to get from where we are to a more sustainable place right. in a way that doesn't you know turn us into uh, 
you know, the Mad Max and people fighting over the last can of tuna fish and all that stuff. Well, I got to tell you, Kevin, uh, it's been wonderful talking to you. You're, well, you're so absolutely much. fantastic, and I uh, hope hope we talk again soon, and I advise everyone to go out and pick up this book. Really appreciate your time. See you soon. Thanks a lot. Take care. Okay. Hey, guys, Steve Malsberg Show. I'm Charles Payne. We'll be right back.